I can't imagine what we're going to talk about today inside coverage. Joey Epstein, he's Frank Schwab. I'm Jason Fitz. We know this at this point. It's the big news. Everybody's talking about it. I'm sitting there headed to the gym thinking it's going to be an easy day yesterday. And all of a sudden, bam, Robert Sala let go as the head coach of the New York Jets. Everybody now trying to figure out chaotically what it means, how it went down. We're going to break that down, plus a bunch more on quarterbacks across the NFL. But let's start, Joey, right out of the gates with the big story. I know you've been covering this. Uh, all over the place for Yahoo. So how did we get here? Yeah, before we figure out how we get there, can we just discuss how Tuesday's news cycle was just absolutely drunk for the NFL? It was one <laughs> thing after the next. The Jets fire Robert Sala, despite the fact that he's not 0-5, he's not 1-4, he's 2-3. and And then we have Russell Wilson being healthy enough for Mike Tomlin to say that the door is ajar. And then we have, oh, Christian Wilkins is out for some games. And, oh, Spencer Rattler's coming in. And, oh, by the way, the Patriots are going to start Drake May. And it was just one thing after the next. It was one of those days where you tell someone, hey, I'll call you right back. And then you're like, Okay, after this and this and this and this. So Tuesday was insane. But to go to your original question, how we got here was our colleague Charles Robinson, I think, laid out really well in his article this idea that Woody Johnson really wasn't the main head of the team when Robert Sala was hired. So you have this coach who was hired. He's not winning a lot of games. Now, you could debate if he had the talent to win those games. He's got a great defense who is playing well on the field and staying motivated off of it despite the fact that they're not winning a lot of games. But the offense is really not clicking. So Robert Sala enters this season with a losing record. And a record that I did have a source tell me that they felt like even going into that week one game against the 49ers, Robert Sala knew like, hey, I'm on a pretty short leash. Like this is not something that was shocking. It might be shocking that after two and three, Woody Johnson said you're out, but it is not shocking to the people close to Robert Sala and the people in that orbit that the leash was not as long as some of the other people in this league. And then you go and you say, okay, the Denver Broncos who are playing with the sixth quarterback drafted this year as a rookie, they beat you at home. Well, then you go to England where Woody Johnson was the ambassador to the UK during the last administration. And all his friends of his place where he was ambassador are watching Sam Darnold who failed with his organization, is succeeding with another, beat the quarterback that he just went all out to get in Aaron Rodgers. And I think um, if you look at it on one hand, you say, did Robert Sala deserve to be fired given their record wasn't as bad as a lot of teams around the league and a lot of previously fired coaches? Or you have Woody Johnson saying, hey, playoffs is the expectation this year, and we're entering a Monday night game against division rival Buffalo Bills. They're coming to our house, so another primetime game that he doesn't want to get embarrassed in. And oh, by the way, if the Jets beat the Bills on Monday, they're in first place in the AFC East. So this is kind of a before it's too late um, timing. And the last thing I'll say is that I was on a Zoom today with several leaders from the locker room, linebacker CJ Mosley, punter Thomas Morstead, right tackle Morgan Moses, and tight end Tyler Conklin. And they had a players-only meeting on Tuesday, and they were saying it's kind of a weird time to have a players-only meeting because usually the players-only meeting, you're like 12 games in, you're eliminated from the playoffs, and you're just trying to say like, hey, we have our integrity, let's keep fighting. This is not that. They are still well within playoff contention and could have playoff in their control after Monday. And so this is really more of like, let's make the changes before it's too late. It is not yet too late for the New York Jets. Yeah, I mean, what Fitz, what have, I mean, we've all talked about for months, like Robert Sala could be gone, whether it's week whatever. Like, yes, was a shock it could happen in week five. He was the first coach to go. Yeah, for sure. But we even talked, I think, Sunday night about, hey, two, three bad games coming up, tough games. If, if they don't start winning these games, Robert Sala's gone. Like, So, no, it's not surprising Robert Sala got fired. And I just think that, as you talked about, Jory, Charles put out a, a very good kind of timeline on, on why this happened now, why it happened, period. And But a lot of this goes back to, I, I, look, I need to say this. I think Robert Sala's a good coach. I think he did as well as could honestly be expected with the New York Jets. It was a dysfunctional franchise. And what's his calling card? His defense. They've had a top three defense each of the last three years. I get it. His record is his record. And hey, you get you go and that's what it is. Like you don't win games, you're gonna get fired in the NFL. But I think Robert Sala is gonna be a very good coach in his second turnaround. Whoever gives him a shot next. Robert Sala is going to do well. I don't think this is all his fault. It's the fault of the franchise for not figuring out the quarterback position. 
Zach Wilson didn't work out. Aaron Rodgers is not working out. Aaron Rodgers is really hard to work with. Nathaniel Hackett is their offensive coordinator, and obviously he's only there for Aaron Rodgers, and he's just in over his head. So a lot of things were working against Robert Sala. But I don't necessarily mind the move by the Jets right now, as you kind of alluded to. It's not too late. Like, if, if you think that we got to do this, don't wait until week nine when you're three and six or whatever. Like, hey, just do it. If, if you think this is the right move, you can still salvage your season. Maybe this does give you a spark. So I, I, I don't hate it necessarily, even though I think Salah is a good coach. It's just, it's just the Jets. This is the Jets. We've talked about this over and over and over. The chaos around the Jets is unmatched by anybody except maybe the Cowboys when things are going bad there. Like it's it's always something with the Jets. And obviously the reaction to past 24, 36 hours, whatever, it kind of concludes it. Yeah, this is just a day in the life of the Jets. Let me let me though kind of give what we always do on this show. Two things can be true. I'm not surprised he was fired. I understand why he was fired. And I also think that the New York Jets season is absolutely done. They're cooked. Find me an example of any team in NFL history that has brought an interim coach into a season where the playoffs and Super Bowl were the expectations and they actually won, right? Like if the expectation here for the Jets is to win a Super Bowl, well, A, they never do that. And B, an interim coach never does that, right? Like, so even if you want to look at me and say, well, Bruce Arians came in and had real success in his interim coach standing, that was a different situation coming in for a coach that was battling cancer. That's a different galvanizing locker room moment, like all of these things. I can't find any example of an interim coach that's come in and suddenly just absolutely been able to will his team to victory. The problem is this offense isn't very good. We have no idea who's going to be calling the offense at this point. The offensive line hasn't played as well as the organization thought they were going to play. I don't care who you bring in like go back and watch the interceptions that Aaron Rodgers threw and tell me how that's Robert Sala's fault like a I don't think you're right like firing him makes sense but b in my mind Jory this means the Jets are done because it just never works this isn't the NHL where an interim coach comes in and has tremendous success this isn't like they're bringing in someone else to put in a whole new playbook and philosophy this is they are making one big change to spur urgency in the organization it might not work, but do you really have to go back that far to find an example of a team that played way better with their interim coach? I think you might be a fan of them, Fitz, last I checked, <laughs> unless something changed dramatically overnight. So I think that I do expect the Jets to win on Monday night against the Bills. I think the Bills have had some of their own problems, and usually we see the shot of adrenaline that teams get. I think to me the bigger question is, one, I do wonder about this idea of, okay, oftentimes we see a special teams coach get the interim role. Why do they get that role? They get that role so that the offensive coordinator could continue to focus on game day, coordinating and calling plays for the offense and the defensive coordinator as such. Well, now you have head coach Robert Sala, who was calling plays for the defense. He's gone. Defensive coordinator Jeff Ulbrich, well, he's now moving up. Is he going to call plays? So I do struggle to see how it could work if you go down two spots for your defensive play caller, given that that's the unit on your organization that has been pretty reliable. Now, I think Jeff Ulbrich will probably try to call plays at least at first, and he might be able to handle it. I did talk to people around the league who are like, look, this guy's really impressive. We think he can. Also kind of a fun little nugget. Uh, Jeff Ulbrich was head coach at the Senior Bowl last year of one of the teams. So while I'm not making that out to be like the be-all end-all for NFL head coaches, I do think he probably got to work out a few of the kinks in his game day operations during that experience. I think what I wonder, though, is – I keep trying to figure out who is calling plays on offense for this team. Nathaniel Hackett has been doing it. Also, you could probably say Nathaniel Hackett has been making suggestions that Aaron Rodgers has been deciding whether or not he wants to take on each snap as he has throughout many of his coaches in his career. The Jets were not very convincing that that will be the structure going forward. I was on calls with team owner Woody Johnson, with interim coach Jeff Ulbrich and Rogers, and I asked right tackle Morgan Moses about this as well. I said, do you know who your play caller is going to be? Again, this is about 30 hours after the firing, and he said, no, we don't, but it's our responsibility. And Woody Johnson said, we know where the weaknesses are. You guys know where the weaknesses are, and we need to make changes there. Jeff Ulbrich did suggest that he's not going to remove anyone from that staff, but that doesn't mean their responsibilities won't change. So I think it is likely that Nathaniel Hackett is not going to call plays for much longer, 
They might leave him as the play caller for Monday night against Buffalo, but unless it goes really well against them, I would be surprised if two games from now he's still calling plays. They have Todd Downing on their staff who has experience as play caller. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, if you're talking about Todd Downing versus Nathaniel Hackett, you know, you talk about people I have experience. I watched those Todd Downing offenses, not just uh, the year that he was with the Raiders, but also putrid, awful, terrible, disgusting years where he was with the Titans. You want to talk about somebody like – the only way Todd Downing is ever given the chance to call plays is if somebody as bad as Nathaniel Hackett is ahead of him in that role. I just, I, this is all part of why I think it's an abject disaster because firing Sala fixes one, maybe, of the many things that are ahead of you. But unless they're suddenly, unless they got somebody wonderkind on that staff we don't know about that suddenly can coordinate an offense and control Aaron Rodgers, man, this is all done. It, it seems to be. Let me ask you, because I'm curious, because you were like, the Jets are done. And I, you might be right. But what's a successful season for them at this point? Let, let me put out a scenario. They go, let's even say 10 and 7, make a wild card, losing a wild card round. Is that a good season for them? Is making a divisional round a good season for them? Or is it like Super Bowl or bust? Like, I, I just don't know. They set up Super Bowl I know, or bust. We that's, and that's what they I keep set thinking. Up Super like, Bowl or who? Bust. Who? The, Jets. the organization when they went all in. Before if you go all in and you get rid of some of your long this talent, this year Woody by, Johnson your young is talent. talking more about playoffs. But I agree with you that when they traded for Aaron Rodgers, right? And yeah, they, this is it. This was their year. Like this is it's the last stop. Like even Aaron said in the off season, if I don't play like I should, we're all going to be gone next year. And it's looking like they're all going to be gone next year. And I just keep the the expectations of. What like just not winning the AFC East, not maybe winning one wild card playoff game. Is that a good season? I don't know. I I, I just I I think it would still feel kind of empty. Uh, I mean, as crazy this, as that is for a team that hasn't made the playoffs in fourteen years. I was going to say, the, but, the, but isn't the, this a lot like LeBron and the Lakers? I know it's a different sport, but let's be real. LeBron comes over to the Lakers, and the question was after he won one championship in the bubble, it was like, well, that's only one chip, and he's with the Lakers. He's got to do more than that. Certain players are held by held to different standards when they're acquired by teams, and there's a concept of truly going all in. The Jets by acquiring Aaron Rodgers and his entire group of buddies, like whoever he wanted them to bring in every year. Like this process was all about winning Super Bowls. It wasn't about being a wild card. I think being a wild card team, like you, you use the Raiders as an example, Rich Bisacci and turning the Raiders around, getting them into the wild card uh, and losing to the Bengals. That was success to me. That mm -hmm. won't be viewed as success for the Jets. Their standard supposedly is being among the elite of the AFC, including but not limited to a Super Bowl or some sort of weird law that tragically keeps them out of the Super Bowl. It's not squeaking into the playoffs, and they created that standard. I don't know that success and failure are as binary as you're making them out to be. I think that, yes, Super Bowl is the ultimate goal. Yes, missing the playoffs is a failure. Getting to the playoffs, winning a playoff game, but not multiple playoff games, I think that is on a spectrum in between. Like, this is a team that has not been to the playoffs since the 2010 season. We cannot say that it is a complete failure if they make it to the playoffs. It's embarrassing because of how much they went out and did, but I do think there's that question. I think also when we talk about the Aaron Rodgers contract, on one hand, he doesn't have guaranteed money after this year. There's a pretty significant uh, dead cap hit if he's gone after this year, but I think that one of the reasons the Jets make a decision like this after five games at two and three when the season is still very much in hand is because like if you're the Dallas Cowboys and you just extended Dak Prescott of course you want to win the Super Bowl this year you want to win the Super Bowl every year but realistically you think you have a five to ten year window at least four years of that contract you think that you want to make sure you're not only competitive this year but competitive for years to come when the Jets got Aaron Rodgers, we knew they had a small window. And when Aaron Rodgers apparently seriously considered leaving the New York Jets to be part of RFK's presidential campaign, I think they had to realize how much bigger of a risk and how much smaller of a window this actually was first time on the team because you just never know with how unpredictable Aaron Rodgers is when he's going to say, hey, I'm good. I've had enough. I don't need to get my ankle like busted by a defensive player from Minnesota overseas anymore. I'm, I'm going to go do the other many things that I'm interested in and quite talented at. And so I think that that's why you make a decision, decision like that now. What I'll ask but, you guys is, given how short this window is and given how this urgency needs to be different, even than other talented teams because of Rodgers' potential to leave at pretty much any moment, do you guys think the Jets, one, should trade for Devontae Adams and two, will trade for Devontae Adams? <laughs> how does the Robert Sala move and the shakeup up top in this organization influence your perspective on what's going to happen with Devontae Adams? I, I think that, and you tweeted about this, this quote from Woody Johnson, 
where he said, basically, whatever we need to do to, to make this a winning season or wh- whatever the words were, I, I forget what exactly it was. And that led me to believe that they're going to be active in the tra- in the trade market. And that means Devontae Adams. I mean, hopefully his hamstring injury heals because goodness knows that's a very serious injury, guys. Like, don't don't take that. Frank's uh, you salty know, about the fact that we try, keep trying to couch this <laughs> as a real injury. Go ahead. It's like, it's like, oh, my God, he's going to be back. Oh, yeah. The, a miracle. Christmas miracle. Anyway, I, I actually do think they're going to trade for Devontae Adams. I just think they're going to dig this hole deeper. And I will say this. I think the Jets could still win that division. As crazy as that sounds, and look, I know this could go the other way. I know that we could be sitting here and they could lose seven in a row because the players are like, screw this. Robert Sala wasn't his fault. We're having a revolt, basically. They know who's calling those offensive plays. They know why that guy is calling offensive plays and which dude brought him in and, and keeps dragging him along in his career, and that's Aaron Rodgers. I, so a revolt could happen, and the, the locker room could give up, basically. It just it could be a really, really ugly season. But this could also be a wake-up call. This could also this could have the effect. Look, Woody Johnson hasn't made the right move in 24 years yet, but he might have stumbled on something here where these players go, whoa, like, this is serious. Like, we, we need to get it together right now. We're the reason that Robert Sala's uh, fired. I, I mean, even Aaron said, if I played a little bit better on Sunday, maybe this wouldn't have happened. And... I think this could be a wake-up call. And they come up fired up, beat the Bills. They're in first place if they do that, as Jory said. And then it's like, well, let's go. Like, we're not too far behind here. And then they trade for Devontae or whoever they're going to trade for. And I think the I think the Jets, this actually might work. I know, Fitz, what, what, I, I understand. Usually interns don't work. What are we doing? But what are we could, doing? This could work. Fitz, Fitz what how benefit does she of the think doubt? they lost? I understand the Broncos are not a good team. They still lost by one point on a super rainy day. I understand that the Vikings should have been someone who, yes, if Brian Flores is intimidating, someone with Aaron Rodgers' mind, who he and a lot of other people think very highly of his mind, they should have been able to thwart those blitzes. They still lost by six points. Like, they're not getting blown out. They need to figure out their offense. They've got a great defense. They have the pieces. But, they also okay. like, okay, run Brees Hall and Braylon Allen a little bit more. Like, some of their pieces, they just are, like, blatantly not using their downfield Brees Hall needs to play game. better, though. Uh, uh, Brees, Brees, Hall, Brees, Brees, Hall, Brees, Brees Hall doesn't get carries because Brees Hall. Brees Hall stinks like, right now. I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly flexible. Y'all are because you are bending over backwards to make excuses <laughs> for why the Jets could turn around and do something. Like, I don't understand. The Jets have just played bad football. I know they haven't been blown out, but look yeah. at the AFC standings. Everybody's either 3-2 and two or 2-3. Two and three. Like, half the league is 3-2 and two or 2-3. Two and three. Everybody's still in it. I get that. So then you got to use the dreaded eye test on all of this. And and the eye test just shows you like the Jets are very good. And if the answer here is now suddenly the owner says, well, we got to do whatever we have to to be successful right now. Well, that also doesn't align with an offense. If they're concerned that that they might just frankly piss Aaron Rodgers off and he's going to walk away at some point, none of that speaks to getting more control of whatever Aaron's doing at the line of scrimmage that isn't good. Like the amount of yeah buts that we're giving the benefit to to the Jets is is just all because we presume that Aaron Rodgers and a talented defense can win. I, I I think it's laughable, and it's not just it's not just this show. It's every show is sitting here saying, "Well, there are cracks in the armor of the Bills. The Bills have at least at times looked good. Like the Jets haven't. I, I I don't understand how we can sit here and give universal benefit of the doubt to the Jets and not to the Bills or not to any other team in this process. Like a bad football team just fired their coach a few games in. That never results in greatness. And, and we're I just feel like we're clamoring to try. And create yes i think they're going to make a big offer i think they're going to try and get Devonte. maybe that makes a lot of sense but man i don't know like it just feels like an organization that's running scared to keep their quarterback happy thinking that's going to win football games when the fact is their offense that is run by that quarterback has looked like trash for much yes. of this season Absolutely. Real quick, uh, the the quote from Woody Johnson via Jory. This is one of the most talented teams that has ever been assembled by the New York Jets. I want to give the team the most opportunity to win this season. Doesn't that tell you that they're not done here? Like this, they're going to add that. Like, but I get it. They haven't. You got Garrett Wilson. You got Garrett Wilson. You got Brees Hall. Get your stars that are capable of the ball. You've got Hassan Reddick that you traded for sitting at home because you don't want to pay him. Like yeah, There are mistake. other things they could actually do that would help them win football games right now. But the presumption is, yeah, they'll go get Devontae. Oh, okay. Is that like... Last time I checked, uh, Devontae being there doesn't change the fact that they haven't gotten the running game going, that their offensive line has been getting Aaron Rodgers murdered, that they, they just don't have Garrett Wilson sort of being the impact. I know 13 catches last week, but like Garrett Wilson hasn't been who we thought Garrett Wilson would be. Like I, I just think there are a million problems with this team right now. 
I think that's what's hard is that I don't think getting Devontae Adams all of a sudden gives you like the be all end all fix to your receiver room because you have a star receiver in Garrett Wilson. What I do think is that Aaron Rodgers tends to work a lot better with people he trusts, with people he feels confident with, and people he feels like he sees uh, the game the same way and he's on the same page. Again, I think some of the throws in recent weeks are Aaron Rodgers and the receivers not being on the same page. All of them deserve some degree of accountability in that. And so the question is, would Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams be more on the same page? I also still think the whole like Hassan Reddick thing is interesting if they were to send him to the Raiders, although that was funny with Woody Johnson being like, hey, uh, Hassan, if you're listening, come down 95, drive on over. We're really looking forward to seeing you. Woody also said that uh, he thinks you need a psychologist or some sort of other gist to understand what has been going on with that situation. So those were just some interesting words. Uh, Also interesting words from Aaron Rodgers on Pat McAfee. We know he loves to go on Pat every week. Uh, It's must listen TV. And uh, he was asked specifically about the power dynamic between himself and Robert Sala. This is what he had to say. As far as any of the ridiculous allegations out there, I'm not going to spend more than uh, one sentence uh, in response to it, and that is that I, I resent any of those accusations because they're patently false. And and uh, it's interesting the amount of power that people think that I have, um, uh, which I don't. But um, I love Robert, and uh, it was... Uh... The only thing I'd say, guys, let me go back to my touring days. Like... Uh, One of the smartest people ever toured with in my life in music was Kenny Rogers, legend of a human being. And Kenny Rogers said something I will never forget for the rest of my life. He said, and we all hear perception is reality. But the thing that Kenny said that was different about that is he said, perception is the only reality that matters because you're living in it and you helped create it. That's the part of it that I think a lot of people forget. Whatever Aaron Rodgers says when he says, I resent these accusations, they're patently false. It's interesting the amount of power that people think I have. Aaron is on one of the largest shows in the world every single week. He has the chance to craft and create his own narrative every single week. Whatever the perception is of Aaron Rodgers, the world stops every time he speaks. He could single-handedly be creating a different perception. He could be part of solving whatever he thinks that problem is. What he doesn't ever do is look in the mirror and realize that whatever we perceive of Aaron Rodgers has been created in part by Aaron Rodgers. And that's the maddeningly frustrating thing to me through all of this. Two things can be true. Our favorite theme of the show. It can be true that Aaron Rodgers did not go to Woody Johnson and ask for Robert Sala to no longer be the coach. He might not even have recommended it or talked badly of Robert Sala on that Monday night call that does seem a little bit weird on the timing that, oh, by the way, they got back from London Sunday night. All normal Monday, they broke down the game. Sala's still the coach. Talks to Rogers Monday night, Johnson calls Rogers, and then Tuesday morning he's fired. I'm not trying to say that happened. I do think it's time. They know that the timing looks weird, which is why both Woody and Aaron addressed it. What is also true is, as you mentioned, Aaron Rodgers has played a part in this, whether or not it was direct. Aaron Rodgers was the one who, as Sala is coming for a hug, he's shoving him on the sideline. As Sala is saying, hey, this cadence stuff might not be working, Aaron is saying in his press conference, or maybe we need to hold people accountable. Aaron Rodgers was not getting up there and saying, we need to save our coach. I talked about this last year in the playoffs, the difference between Dak Prescott's response and Jalen Hurts' response at the end of their season when they both had playoff losses that the organization did not like. When Jalen Hurts was asked about Nick Sirianni, he was like, oh, is that a question that he's out of there? But he did not say, I want Nick to be our coach. He just said, I didn't know that that was a question. Dak said, if you think Mike should get out of here, take me out of here. I need to be responsible. I need to do this. I'm not trying to get ta- get even to like what they did on the field, but I think that all of these guys know the power of the microphone, particularly, as you said, someone like Aaron, who chooses to do an hour-long show like this every week in addition to his media responsibilities at the Jets organization. And I think he planted seeds, whether or not they were intentional. I think most of what he does is pretty calculated because he's a very smart guy. And I think that whether or not he thought that that was the ultimate move to get over the hump, that's a question. But whether he planted the seeds, that's not a question. Right. There, there's a big difference between getting your coach fired and keeping him from being fired. Like, I mean, you know, yeah, I don't think that Aaron Rodgers called the code red or anything, but I don't think he really stopped it either. Yeah, I, it's so funny that like Woody is saying, I didn't talk to Aaron Rodgers at all about yeah, the Salah situation that, on Monday way. night. Come, but I'm like, saying even so. <laughs> you're right. Like, it's just so ridiculous when people lie to us and, and insult our intelligence like that. Like, come on. You, you called Aaron Rodgers uh, on a Monday night you 
I'm pretty sure you knew you were going to fire your coach, and that just never comes up. Like, oh, slip my mind, Aaron. I, I was going to tell you, oh, but... Oh, no, yeah, Frank, it was better. Aaron said today, quote, Woody has no obligation to let me know what his plans are. Whether or not he knew what he was doing in that moment was inconsequential. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so uh, He's to be also clear here, so whatever. To be clear here, Brian Gutekunst had an obligation to call Aaron Rodgers and say, I'm drafting a quarterback and talk to the quarterback initially. And the fact that he didn't fractured the relationship with the Packers forever. But Woody Johnson has no obligation to call him and tell him, hey, the guy that runs the entire ob uh, organization is going to be fired tomorrow. Like, I, I don't know how stupid everybody thinks we are in this situation, particularly Aaron. I know that he loves to believe he's the smartest man in every single room. I'm not that stupid. I, that's okay. all I'm saying. Fitz. But Devontae I Adams agree has with a hamstring you, Fitz, injury, that, guys. That is you a know, great parallel stupid. that you drew and the whole Goody thing. Like, I do think that's relevant here. I also will say that them drafting his successor when he won a Super Bowl with them and had played for them for like close to two decades is a different situation than when he showed up and played five games for them and it's not someone coming for his job. So I do think there's a difference, no. even but though firing, maybe he doesn't deserve this benefit of the doubt. Firing the guy that has made it clear he doesn't appreciate some of the decisions you've made that controls the entire culture of the locker room when you're in the last guaranteed year of any money and you can just walk away from the game feels pretty significant too. I realize that they're not hiring the person that's coming directly for Aaron Rodgers' job, but they just impacted absolutely everything that will happen to Aaron Rodgers between now and the Super Bowl by by firing Robert Sala. Like uh, drafting Jordan Love was going to eventually impact him. This impacts him right now like I just I, I understand they're different scenarios but I just I don't think they're so different that the owner can just be like oh no no worries like like again if we're sitting here saying God what we don't want to do is piss Aaron off because we don't want him just to walk away right. that's a that's a crippling salary cap number uh, so with that in mind knowing that the organization doesn't want to do that the organization doesn't tell him they're about to fire a heck I'm not buying it I'm not buying any like I will not buy these conspiracy theories <laughs> And the, the the thing about it too is I don't mind if the owner asks Aaron Rodgers his opinion on this stuff. There are he guys should. like every, everybody, like you brought up LeBron before. Everybody gets so uptight about oh LeBron calls all the shots. LeBron James has earned that. Like he's one of the two greatest players of all time. Aaron Rodgers is one of the five greatest quarterbacks of all time, and he's the guy on that team. If he's been around forever, if Woody Johnson calls him and says. Hey, what do you think? I actually don't have a problem with that as much as other people might. But uh, yeah, something obviously no, Woody was said is on Monday night. protecting everyone here. Yes, of course. I get. I get. He's got to say what he's got to say. Aaron's got to say what he's got to say. Doesn't mean any of us got to believe it, though. Let's put it that you way. You can't but protect I I, everybody and then tell me you resent accusations. I just. Yeah, I, that's I, the thing. I mean, he lays it on so thick when all this woe is me Pollyanna routine that it's it's so hard to take him seriously. Oh, it was when better he than that. that. He was talking about Salah's family and the kids and how hard this is and Salah's son, Adam, who he threw with during training camp and how he was thinking about Adam having to go to school and his classmates' parents saying something to him. I mean, there is a lot to unpack. All of which uh, again, I believe. I believe that he feels for the family, but the yes, truth can too. both be true. That is that is the ultimate. I I have been a part of firing people from very successful gigs. I have been a part of it, and it is real to say, hey, I was part of firing discussions. Also. You do sit down there and say, man, that's really going to stink for their family. Man, what's he going to do? Yeah. He's got a baby on the way. All these things that yeah. like, I think it, it's normal and natural. Like he's still Aaron Rodgers, as hard as I've been on him for the first half an hour of the show, is still a human being. So like I, I, I do think, Jory, you're right. Like all of this can make sense. I'm fired up. I'm going to get I'm going to get a little I'm going to okay, get a drink. One more note that this is uh, okay. not that pertinent, but they were also making all these jokes on McAfee about Aaron Rodgers and his ayahuasca use. And he was like, can I just put it out there and clear the record that I'm not a recreational user of ayahuasca? So he has done it, but not recreationally. And he not wants you to know that. Who doesn't do it recreationally? I just took I was gonna say, like, ayahuasca bong hit before we came on here. You know, why not? Yeah. Look, I'd love to be a recreational ayahuasca uh, user if anybody wants to hit me up. Like, I, I've got to, I've got some <laughs> successful buddies that go on a trip every year, like to a random, like random country. And they all sit on the beach and surf and then like take a bunch of mushrooms. I, I, I want in on that. That's the... That's but that see, but it, it won't be recreational. It'll just be the occasional. I'll call it my ayahuasca trip. Uh, all right. We're going to pay some bills. We're going to take a break. When we come back, there are starting quarterback changes all over the league. We'll address all of them and get you caught up on what you need to know next. 
Now that we've had a spirited conversation, I've had a sip of my berry tea. I feel uh, I feel calm. I feel soothed. You know, I feel like I feel like I'm, I'm I'm ready for the the last half of this show. All right, uh, big news, and not the least of which. Uh, was obviously Drake May is now going to be the starting quarterback for the New England Patriots. And Jory, I was really excited for you on this show this week because the three of us have had really, I think, informed, passionate conversations on why maybe it wouldn't be best for Drake to start at all this year. And now he's starting. So what do you make of the decision? Yeah, I think that there are two elements you have to consider in this decision. There's what's best for the Patriots in the short term and what's best for them in the long term. Arguably, you could go even further and say what's best for the Patriots and what's best for Drake May. But let's start with what's best for the Patriots. In the short term, at the beginning of the season, the Patriots believed that Jacoby Brissett was the quarterback who was most going to help them win now. I talked to head coach Gerard Mayo about this. I talked to offensive coordinator Alex Van Pelt when I visited them, and he said, look, when we play against the Bengals week one and you need to know the protections, you need to know what the defensive coverages are, you need to understand how to get the ball out and not make mistakes, Jacoby has done a lot of that. He's been in this system, all of these things. The problem is five weeks later and four straight losses later, Jacoby is no longer having that edge in terms of likelihood to win this week against the Patriots. And so then the Patriots have this situation where in the short term, no longer is it best for Jacoby Brissett to start. The problem with that is that in the long term, I have talked to so many coaches and general managers around the league who believe that you can ruin a quarterback by starting him too early. And by too early, I don't only mean too early relative to the quarterback's development to the pro level physically and mentally and understanding the playbook, but also putting him in when he is not set up to succeed. The whole Sam Darnold seeing ghost things, think how long it took for him and how many franchises later it took for him to find the right fit. You don't want that to be you if you're the Patriots. You look at what Baker Mayfield is doing now with Tampa Bay, and that's kind of a different situation as we discuss next week. But if you are drafting a guy, particularly with a third overall pick, you want him to succeed in the NFL with your franchise. And putting him in with this offensive line is not as a, a successful uh, recipe for that. So I crunched some of the numbers on this, and I went to all sorts of sites and next-gen stats and all the things. And yes, Jacoby Brissett, has not been efficient. His passer rating is like 29th. He's he's really low down there on a lot of passing stats. But also, almost everyone in the league is throwing to receivers with better separation than him. When you look at his uh, protection, no team is worse than the Patriots at pass block win rate. No team is worse at allowing quarterback pressures. The Patriots have the highest quarterback pressure rate allowed, and they also have the highest unblocked quarterback pressure rate allowed. They have the worst pressure rates from the left tackle, the center, and their right guard positions. <laughs> and so now you are saying that, hey, Drake, good luck. Everyone's going to be coming for you. You'll have no time to throw in your receiver. Your receivers will not have separation. And rather than waiting until we play the Jacksonville Jaguars next week, who also are struggling, we are going to start you against the Houston Texans, who have the fourth best pass rush win rate. And oh, by the way, Daniel Hunter is leading the league in pressures and Will Anderson is not far behind him. So I'm not saying that Drake's athleticism won't allow him to create some more plays and increase their chance of winning right now. But do I worry about the long-term effects for Drake and the organization who wants Drake to succeed with them? Absolutely. Yeah, I don't like it. I, I just don't like the move right now. And I'm a, again, I'm a proponent of put him in there and let him play because usually that's how you get better. We've seen a lot of quarterbacks have success that way. Yeah, Jordan Love happens sometimes. That can be a path to success as well. But we don't know that Jordan Love would wouldn't have been good right away, right? Like I mean, it, you you generally learn by doing things, and I think that in most cases that's how I would do it. In this case, though, as you talked about, Jory, this offense is such a mess that you, it's not just you know always going to get hurt, which might happen. I guess I, I I don't know about that predicting injuries or anything. But to me, it's falling into bad habits. It is. You're not playing like when you're playing behind the offensive line that bad, and those stats you put out there were just stunning. Actually, you're going to develop bad habits. You are going to your your eyes are going to be down on the pass rush and not downfield. You are going to be escaping the pocket when there's no pressure at all. You're going to be developing those bad habits. Nobody wants to see out of their quarterback. I hope that doesn't happen for Drake May. Hope he has a successful run here. Hope he you know he goes into year two feeling good about himself, fundamentally sound still. But I just wonder what these next few weeks are going to do for Drake May. It's not going to be easy at all. Maybe that'll make him better in the long run, but I don't see it that way. I think they should have waited, especially like you said, 
don't throw them out there against the Texans. Like, this is one of the teams that, look what they did to Caleb a couple of weeks ago. Like, this is a team that can get after you as far as if you can't protect, they're, they're just going to send pressure and pressure and pressure. D'Amico knows that better than anybody. They got two good rush ends. This is not the week to start Drake May. And honestly, this isn't really the month or maybe the season to start Drake May. I, I just, I wouldn't do it. And the other thing I think that we shouldn't overlook is that I know that quarterbacks don't face off against each other. I also think that we have made very clear perception matters in the NFL. Woody Johnson's team losing in England to his former quarterback mattered to the former ambassador who they're still calling the ambassador on our conference calls. I think that probably the really? worst, Wait, they, they, yeah. literally yeah. they introduced him as Ambassador Johnson. Thank you for your time yesterday. No and I'm kidding? like, Are you I'm like I get you're always present if you're present. You're not <laughs> oh always ambassador God. if you're once Yeah, ambassador. like that, that was my question. Is, oh, are you always God. ambassador? No, like, no, you're always okay. president. You you're not always wow. ambassador. All right, anyway, sorry, back, just back from the diversion, there, I think that while quarterbacks don't directly face each other on the field, they are judged against each other in a game. So I think the worst quarterback who Drake May could get his first start against would be Jaden Daniels because they're in the same class. Jaden Daniels is having a lot of success, and that is the benchmark. The second worst is C.J. Stroud because everyone saw last year what happened and think about what happened to Bryce Young and how much they were compared. It's not going to start Drake May and say, well, this guy figured it out his first year, and yeah, maybe he had more pieces, but not all the pieces, and that is going to be factored into what Robert Kraft and what these people think Drake May should be able to do. Part of this to me, every quarterback is different and the trajectory for all of them is different. The main goal here is to develop a quarterback to be the face of the franchise for the future. And, and Jory, you made such a smart point when you talked about short-term, long-term. I guess my question to the Patriots is, what are your short-term goals that are really going to be accomplished here that help you long-term? Because in my mind, if Drake helps you win two more games this season... What are you going to be a five win team? So now right. you're going to pick fourth and what's in your the draft. draft spot? That's actually right. Good that's point, exactly yeah. it. Like now you're pushed down to fourth or fifth in the draft instead of first or second. And, you know, next year where there isn't a clear cut first overall pick at quarterback, maybe you want first shot at one of these wide receivers or defensive ends or offensive linemen that somebody's in love with. Maybe you want the draft equity that comes, the trade equity that comes with it. Like Drake may playing well enough to win you two extra games actually hurts what you're trying to develop long term. So if I'm looking at the Patriots and I'm looking in the mirror, I'm saying, well, what did we expect? We expected that this roster top to bottom is probably the worst in the NFL top to bottom. There's a lot that needs to be worked on. So we're going to slow. Low and low over here with Drake May. We're not going to worry about what anybody else thinks. We're going to slowly develop the quarterback, and then we're going to put better structure around him over the course of an offseason that gives us the chance to draft better and then pick up some play pieces in free agency. Like Even if this is a short-term win, it's a long-term loss. And, and now you're taking the, the gamble that, in addition to that, you might mess up the person that you need to develop into your long-term solution. So I think this is a bad move for the Patriots, even though I believe Drake May long-term could really be a good player. Like I loved the pick. I love the quarterback. I just don't love playing the quarterback on this team right now as it stands. I think the one point in that that I disagree with is if you are Andy Reid and you're losing or you're Bill Belichick or you're Mike Tomlin, some of these coaches who have been around for a while, establish their culture, people know what they're going to expect from you, you can get away with kind of a rebuild year. When you're in the first year as your head coach and you're establishing a culture, it matters more. When we look at the Carolina decision to bench Bryce Young and go with Andy Dalton, that was a big part of Dave Canales saying, hey, I can't lose my entire locker room. It helps that Gerard Mayo has been with the Patriots for a long time. He's been their defensive coordinator. He's coached for them. He's played for them. And so, yes, he has a better familiarity with this group and what he stands for. I still think as the head coach, and he's trying not to be Bill Belichick and say like, hey, this is not the last organization. We have to do it our way. I do think that him being in the first year as head coach makes a difference in how important it is to win now, regardless of what that does for your draft standing. I, I think it makes a difference too, and that it's probably going through his mind is, I don't want to take a 1-16 in, in my first year and then get a call from Robert Kraft right as soon as the season ends and tells me I'm gone. Like That has happened before, and decisions are made all the time with uh, your your personal well-being in mind and maybe Jared Mayo doesn't want to you know take a 16 game losing streak into the offseason not to say that they would lose 16 in a row with Jacoby but they look exactly as bad as I thought they would coming into the season I still do not have any idea how they beat the Cincinnati Bengals in week one I'll never figure that one out but this is a bad football team and you know you preservation is a thing in the NFL and maybe Jared is saying 
Drake May gives us a shot to win a couple of games. I need that. I, I can't just I can't I just can't take sixteen in a row here uh, to go into the off season. If I'm bribing the schedule makers and I have the Bengals on my schedule, I am asking for a week one game <laughs> week against one, the Bengals. That's the Cincinnati. best time for someone to face How those did they Cincinnati lose that? Like we are gonna that 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 game is gonna age so weirdly that by the end of the season we're gonna be like the 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 Patriots won but one game this year, year. And it was at Cincinnati week one like yeah, what? It's just yeah the, every the year, annual every Cincinnati year. tradition every year See, we can't keep but, being surprised by Cincinnati starting crazy. the season slowly uh, Jory educate me on something real quick because we've now mentioned Belichick's name a couple of times and it just occurred to me like what prevents the Jets what what would prevent Woody Johnson right now from calling Bill I mean Pride. like hey <laughs> like come like hey come be our head coach right now. Like instead of making an interim coach, we're hiring Bill Belichick right now. Come, come, take over this organization. Okay, first of all, I don't know why you go to Bill Belichick before you go to Jeff Saturday when you think of people you should bring into the organization who have been with the organization <laughs> previously. Oh but that aside, Fair. from like a rule standpoint, nothing prevents them. Do I think that Belichick is just going to say, "Yeah, let me go try and figure this out in the middle when I can't get my personnel in there, when I can't get my playbook, and oh by the way, I have some history with the Jets, some of which I don't feel that positively about." I don't think he's going to do that. Did Woody call him? I don't know. What I think is interesting, and I said this on radio yesterday, um, so I'm going on Monday night to the Bills at Jets game. The last time I went to Monday Night Football a couple weeks ago, it was in Philadelphia, who is a team that is linked to Bill Belichick, and Belichick was walking the sidelines. He and Matt Patricia, Matt Patricia was, of course, on that Philly staff last year, and kind of they were shaking hands, doing all the things. I would not be surprised if Belichick, ahead of his Monday Night Football appearance on Manning Cast this week, is also on that Jets sideline. So do I think that Bill is going to keep lingering and not just lingering virtually, but physically being at some of these places that he has easy excuses for why he should be there? Yes, and I will try and get video of that if I see it. But I don't think it's going to be a midseason situation. And by the way, I know we haven't talked much about Jeff Ulbrich. He's extremely well respected both on and off the field in that organization. He really, I mean, like you, the presence when he talks to us in interviews, the way he explains things, the way he articulates, just the guy he is. I've also talked to people who worked with him previously. He worked with Dan Quinn and the Atlanta staff. I do think that he has a chance to keep this job for next oh, year. Yeah, yes, they have to make the playoffs probably, but I do think that he could be a very good coach for the New York Jets for a long time. And I think that I'm not positive Bill Belichick has more to offer this season or next season for the New York Jets. And I also think if he wants to be GM, he might not have more to offer. And here's the thing I wrote about this today. Let's say let's say they don't make the playoffs and Albert doesn't get the job, because I don't think he would if they don't make the playoffs, because why would you? I mean, you just fired Salo. You're going to bring in his defense court. Like, that, that wouldn't make sense if you don't make the playoffs. They're going to be sitting down with coaching candidates in January and say, come coach for the New York Jets. And every one of those coaching candidates is going to say, why? What what do you have to offer? Your quarterback is probably retiring, or he's coming back. I don't even know which is better for for a new coach at this point. They have a lot of talent. To offer. Right? Do they? They have yeah. a lot of old talent. They got a lot of old guys. They don't have a lot of. I mean, they do. They have a few building blocks. Quinn and Sauce Gardner, maybe Brees. I don't know what the heck's going Garrett on with Wilson. him. Garrett Wilson. Okay, Th those are. But as an organization, the one that's going to have at that point in this scenario the longest playoff drought in North American professional sports, an owner that everybody thinks is one of the worst in the NFL. No solution at the quarterback's Do position. Do people think Woody There's Johnson a... is one of the worst owners in the NFL? Oh, yes. Yes. If, if it wasn't I'm not for saying Tepper, people think like... highly of him, but there are so many bad owners in the NFL. I guess they yeah, have that, a pretty a, it's mired a crowded room. It's history, a very crowded but from room, like but... a people actually caring about the owner, I don't think of him as I think he's a list. I think he's definitely a minus. Okay. Ambassador Johnson is a minus when it comes to the NFL owner room. And I just don't know what you sell. Like, let's say Ben Johnson. What would you sell Ben Johnson? Like, well, maybe we'll get a quarterback back in three years who knows like I, the, the Jets are maybe coming up on a very very difficult uh, uh rebuild I, I mean it it, it what are they going to do like this that as Fitz pointed out they went all in well what happens when you go all in and you miss like what okay. happens next it's a scary situation for the Jets uh, I, I will move on from the Jets before my blood starts boiling again I will just say that Woody Johnson is way less ambassador Woody and more like Woody from Toy Story to me right now. All right. Uh, hey, that's Russell, so nice to Woody from Toy Story. Yeah, Woody from no, Toy Story, fair. man. That's that, fair. Well, a, I mean, gee, yeah. What did he do that, for against you? Yeah, right. Well, why why, why time, is there this Woody hate all of a sudden? There's well, this Woody hate for me because the first time I ever... Do you have anything you want to say about Buzz Lightyear as well? Yeah, right. Buzz Lightyear is an American treasure. Woody, you Woody. Thought, we you just thought that because I don't know much pop culture that you're going to be able to get that by. But until the time I was 10, I knew some things. 
There you All go. right, Jory. What, the first time I ever walked in, in in Nashville, I just moved there. I was days living in Nashville. And I walked into a cowboy hat place and I put on a cowboy hat. And the sales guy from across the room screamed. He's like, hey, man, with that hat on, you look like Woody from Toy Story. <laughs> Ever since then, I have a beef with Woody. I was going to say, he it was wasn't clear wrong. that there something here was deeply something. rooted. Had to be something. Thank yeah. you for your huh. honesty. You're welcome. I I don't look like Woody. Well, I do look a little like Woody from Toy Story with the cowboy hat. Uh, Russell Wilson, I don't know how to segue to this. So we'll just go to Russ. A uh, full participant Wednesday uh, Wednesday practice for the first time since he injured his calf. So now all the questions are, look, Justin Fields, he's left the, the window open, the door open a little bit, like the window's cracked. I'll use all my analogies. Uh, is there a possibility Russ is now going to come in and start? So, Jory, uh, what do you think at this point? Like, it, Does it make sense to bring Russ in? It's so interesting because if you asked me this question a week ago, I thought Justin Fields was getting really close to taking that job. He started the season off slowly. Yes, they were 3-0, and but it was kind of a tenuous 3-0, and like, are you a contender, pretender, probably a pretender situation. Against the Colts, they started slowly and he fumbled, but in the second half, Justin Fields looked great. He had one of the better passing games that he had had all season. His legs were working well. He scored touchdowns on three straight drives, two rushing touchdowns, one passing touchdown, and along the way was using both skill sets. But against the Cowboys, uh, he really kind of took a step back. And the problem is that Dak threw two interceptions and lost a fumble in a strip sack. And the Steelers only scored off one of those three turnover situations. And so if you're saying, well, we have a defense and we just need the quarterback to do enough. Well, when you're in favorable field position, when you get that ball back, you need to be able to capitalize. And so I think that bringing Russell back, there is this question of, hey, what could Russell have done in that situation? I think that Mike Tomlin was pretty intentional when he chose not to name Justin the starter for any sort of extended period of time while Russell is out. I think it's more likely that Justin starts this week. I don't know. Again, just based off what Mike was saying, that Justin was still going to take first team reps for now. They want to see how Russell is doing. Yes, he is medically cleared, but there's also the can you protect yourself? Are you mobile enough? By the way, you're playing behind a super injured offensive line. And so I think there are some questions that they need to ask. We talked about the Patriots and how unimpressed I am with their decision to start Drake May against the Houston Texans rather than against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Well, if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers, you got the Raiders this week and then the Jets and the Giants. I think the Jets defense scares me more than the Raiders. I know that the Raiders defense is better than the offense. But so if I'm trying to get Russell Wilson back, I'm saying, hey, I think I want to play him against the Raiders. And oh, by the way, no Christian Wilkins. That's a really big win for the quarterback. And so I think you kind of have these questions of, This game should be relatively quarterback friendly and whichever quarterback you want, you can give them kind of the keys this week. The problem is if you believe Russell's better, but you want to give Justin one more week because you say, hey, then we can feel really good about this decision. Not like there's ambiguity. Well, if Justin plays better against a bad defense, again, when I told someone in the league who recommended to me that Russell was going to be able to take the Steelers to another level, I was like, but what about what Justin did against the Colts? And the person responded, you can't put too much stock into what a quarterback does against a bad defense. I don't know that I fully agree with it, but I think there's something there. What do you guys think? Who do you think is more going to be able to take the Steelers where they want to go? I I think Justin gets one more start and then they pull the plug and and let Russell. I I think Tomlin is so dug in on this Russell Wilson thing for some reason that it's going to happen at the first realistic opportunity. Like and by the way, Justin Fields' mobility would be good. The Raiders defense is basically Max Crosby and nobody else. Every everybody's it's decimated by injuries on that defensive line, particularly. They've lost so many people that matter on that defensive line. So what you really got to do is get around Max. Having the mobility of Justin, I think, helps there. So I I I think Justin Fields gets one more start. The question is, is that enough to keep him at bay? Interestingly. Whoever, Justin Fields or Russell Wilson, one thing we know is that they'll be facing a different quarterback. In Vegas, Aiden O'Connell officially named the starter uh, by uh, Antonio Pierce today. Uh, and this, uh, guys, this didn't surprise me. Gardner Minshew has been reckless with the football. Uh, the, he's, the turnovers have been absolutely horrible. So you're talking about a veteran quarterback that's made some throws that are just absolutely regrettable over the last few weeks. I understand the move, but I'll also say this. Aiden O'Connell is not particularly mobile. So now a bad offensive line for the Raiders is taking on a great defensive line for the Steelers. I feel like Aiden O'Connell is just going to go back there and take – it's going to be like taking on Tyson in his prime. Like he's just going to get knocked the you-know-what out over – and over and like this feels like an eight sack game for Pittsburgh coming into this yeah, one. The, this this ain't the last time they make a quarterback change this season. I don't think uh, it's just this What's is the, what who's we expect the next too. one too. Back to back, back to guard. It'll, back be, to this, guard. It'll yeah. be back to guard or back to Aiden and 
I don't even know if they, who's our third at this point. I, I couldn't. It even doesn't tell matter. You. It doesn't uh, matter. Yeah, it's at just some good. point though, These... week sixteen, they're gonna be so fed up they start him, and it's it's just, it's just a trade mess. Trade for Russell things. Wilson. Trade trade for Aaron Rodgers. Just bring it. That's what uh, I heard. Y'all, from I one picked of my a buddies. bad fall yeah, to stop drinking. That's all I'm saying. Uh, like this really comes. Like I picked a bad fall to not okay, be drunk. It's okay. You got your like, ayahuasca beach situation. There you go. Ayahuasca. Yeah. It'd be a recreational Frank and I user. have to do a show every Sunday night, so I can't be ayahuasca during the Raiders game. Like <laughs> and that won't lead to a very good inside coverage. Ayahuasca Why lead to a great one? Who knows? I mean, that's that's fair. Uh, I'll have to ask Stone what the the corporate policy is on ayahuasca retreats during Raiders games. <laughs> It, 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 yeah, ask Stone, our, rep- our our producer extraordinaire, <laughs> to, to find out how stoned I could be when we actually exactly. have to react to all of these. Uh, all right, Frank did his power rankings. We'll react to that when we come back. Frank, you did your power rankings. We all love the power rankings. It's one Everyone of my favorite does. things. Everyone, I, I don't get yeah. any negative feedback at all. It's incredible. Yeah, no, I, I feel that. Uh, let me ask you, because I think one of the most interesting teams was Seattle. And I know Seattle dropped in your rankings. I've struggled all year to of what to make of Seattle because I don't think they look particularly good against bad opponents, but then they did look particularly good in a loss to the Lions, and then they come around and they don't look good for the Giants. So how did you sort of get there with them? I, I hate to admit this. I don't take things personally generally, but when I have faith in a team and they totally let me down, I'll sometimes ground them. I'll sometimes put them way down in the rankings. Just, just uh, don't like do that. that again. You know, I, I, I'm petty like that sometimes. So that's what I did to Seattle. It's like, dude, are you serious? You're going to lose to the Giants without Malik Neighbors at home? Well, you got to go way down. Because I, I showed faith in them, kept them at number 10 after they lost to the Lions. Uh, but now it, it does. It, like, all the criticism of them being kind of a, a Fugazi, a 3-0 and start. Well, yeah, you didn't beat anybody. And that kind of showed through when you lose to the Giants at home. How how do you lose to the Giants at home? So they had to go down, and I probably put them down a couple of spots more than I should have just because I, I thought highly of this team. But now I look back and I'm like, yeah, everything people were telling me about they haven't beaten anybody actually has to be taken into account now. Okay, you have to also see how they got to those results, though. And like they did look good against the Detroit Lions for a good team. I think for me, the thing about the Giants is I think the Giants are better than people are giving them credit for. I don't that think they're one of the yes, best yeah. teams in the NFL, but I think what happened is Daniel Jones started against the Minnesota Vikings and Brian Flores got booed by fans on the way out and that hole went bad. And everyone thought, oh, this is actually like him being terrible against an average team as opposed to him being average against a really good team. Then they play the commanders lose last second. Everyone's like, well, the commanders are supposed to be bad too. No, Jaden Daniels is actually incredible and drastically elevating. And those two teams have continued to do that against other teams and are five and zero and four and one. And then they kind of settled in. So I think that the giants and losing against them, it's not that crazy. The problem is they lost to a giants team without Malik neighbors and without Devin Singletary. And, and that they had, and Joy, they had a 102 yard fumble return for a touchdown. Yeah. And he's still lost. Like, how? That's that's bad. That's bad football. Yeah, I, I think through all of this, I just don't think I, I think it's okay to have an incomplete grade sometimes. And right now, the Seahawks for me are a massive incomplete. Because I just I don't know if they're good or bad. I also don't know if the Broncos, like, I've, everybody's been ripping me because I keep saying the same thing. The Broncos are a bad football team. Yes, they beat the Raiders. Huzzah. The Raiders are also a bad football team. Let me loudly say this again. Two bad football teams played. That's not a, that's not breaking news. But Broncos fans are in my mind. She's constantly right now saying, you say we're, we're bad, but we're really not. I don't know, Frank, like their defense is pretty good. And the rest of it, I I just, I don't trust any of their offensive weapons. I still don't believe they have a quarterback in the future. And I don't think their offensive line is all that. So like, I have a hard time finding, figuring out what to do with the Broncos, whose defense is better than I give them credit for. You moved them way up. Why? Yeah, I had to move them 16 because, Mm -hmm. hey, they're winning games. A lot of teams out here aren't winning games, but I am. I do have a lot of faith in this defense. I'll say that. Like this defense is legit. I didn't think they would be coming into the season. Again, I've talked a lot about Patrick Sertan, how incredible he is, the season he's having. He is really leading a charge here. This is, and they get the Chargers this week. Why can't they beat the Chargers? Like, we're going to be looking up and be like, wow, the Broncos are four and two. Like, they're easily the second best team in the AFC West. I couldn't put them much lower than 16. Like, yeah, they're, and they have a great coach, Sean Payton, who always steals wins. There's certain coaches who you just, and Mike Tomlin being one of them, Sean Payton proved this last year. We can give them a bad team and they're going to win three, four more games than they should just because of the coaching. And I think that's the road we're heading now with the Broncos this year.
Yeah, I don't think the Broncos are just going to be four and two. I think they're going to be five and two, if not of six and two, because after the Chargers, they face the Saints, who it should be those weeks right. where I believe Derek Carr will still be out and they'll be probably going against Spencer Rattler, which a rookie quarterback against a really good defense. Oh, that then defense you go to the Carolina Spencer Rattler. Good. Then you gracious. go to the Carolina Panthers, yep. who obviously mm-hmm. you don't want them playing a really good defense. So really by the time they get to the Ravens, they could easily be six and two. Now I'm very excited to see what the Broncos can do in that November schedule. They'll have that time to settle in. They'll understand what they want to do with Bo Nix. And then they have the Ravens and Chiefs back to back. Because again, even if the Broncos are very good to guarantee their playoff spot, they got to win against the Chiefs. I mean, this is, they're still in the Chiefs division. And so I think that's kind of where we run into a snag with them. I think they'll come crashing down to earth. Uh, look, every year there's a team like Minnesota a few years ago or Philly last year that that wins some games and you're like, ah! I'm still. Philly I'm, won a I, lot of games before they crashed yeah, last year. Yeah, they won no, 10 no and, doubt. Ten and zero. But, but the crash, know. the the crash was inevitable. The crash was inevitable. Also inevitable. Thursday night football. Frank's going to get it right, and I'm not. Uh, we now have uh, we have separation at this point. Frank has gotten four Thursday night games right. Jory also got it right last week. As a result, Jory has two games right. I have one. Uh, San Francisco we got unlucky is last at, week, though. That that Tampa was the right side. I'm sorry. I'm still mad. I'm still angry. Well, uh, I mean, Falcons. Uh, Falcons covered. That's all that mattered. Yeah. Uh, San Francisco at Seattle. Seattle is a three and a half point underdog. So Frank, as our great leader, uh, what way should we go on this? San Francisco at Seattle. Seattle, a three and a half point dog. I told you, Seattle's grounded. They, I, I got to go San Francisco here. The 49ers really match up well against Seattle. They have beaten the heck out of them the last few seasons. I don't see any reason that changes. And now you face a San Francisco team that because of some fluky losses is angry. They're they're not trying to go two and four. Like this is a focused, we're ready to go 49ers team against a Seahawks team that couldn't even beat the Giants at home. I, I think the spread is too low here. I think the, I think the 49ers handle business and do so pretty easily. Yeah, I think that the Niners are struggling with some injuries. Obviously, Christian McCaffrey is one of the bigger names, but they're going against Seattle team that's really struggled from a defensive front injury standpoint. And so I think that when you look at that and when you look at how familiar these two teams are being NFC West opponents, I trust that Kyle Shanahan is going to have the game plan to elevate the remaining guys who are healthy. It's rough for Seattle, but San Francisco needs this more than Seattle does to get back to what they want to be relative to expectations. So I think San Francisco will win by more than two and a half. Yeah, I, I actually, we are all on the same page. We're all picking San Uh-oh, Francisco. So there's no, yeah, that's bad, actually. That's, that, that's bad. That's bad. Sorry, <laughs> you went third. Change your vote. <laughs> well, no. Well, even Gino. I'm, it's not too I, late. I need to Mike get a, McDonald, I, Ryan Grubb. Go, go, go. I need go, to get go. something here. I did play a little, uh, a little, a uh, little action on this one, a little, 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 little dabbling on the yeah, wide receiver over. overs. Yeah. I, I kind of like some yardage overage uh, on this for uh, for Jackson Smith and Jigba. Uh, I like that. I also like some yardage overage uh, when it comes to uh, uh, to uh, DK. So I feel like uh, uh, and Stone, by the way, our producer extraordinaire has taken the Seahawks. He is going to be the normalizer of this. So somebody in this can take it's the Stone. other side of it. Stone, we Stone is trying to, I don't see him on the counter. Stone. No, Stone is just now injecting himself in to be like the dissenting I am voice. I yeah. Stone taking Homer. the Seahawks, whether or not he believes them, but I think you got to take someone every week. You can't just decide you're going to take someone only when your team plays and you want to root for them. <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 she might have a point there, Stone. Like, we need Stone's point. pick every week. Uh, so Stone, start throwing your pick in. And uh, we'll we'll make sure that we get that mentioned out. Uh, you can obviously follow us on social media. You <laughs> know that. I was going to retroactively pick everyone else, right? And suddenly be in first place. <laughs> hey, I was 4-0, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I like that. Also, you peek behind the curtain, guys. Jory has now, she's now actively booing Stone in our chat uh, during the taping of this. She's I feel booing. like it was warranted. He deserved well, I, it. I thought I thought maybe you were just like scaring him because it's Halloween like he's season. doing God's work and I'm like, boo. <laughs> And that's what we've gotten to. Uh, it's it's a wild week. Here's what Probably I can guarantee you. We'll be back we on stop. Friday with C-Rob. We'll have more of the breaking news. I'm sure this week is going to continue to give all of us chaos. As always, rate, revi- re- mm, rate wow, review, wow. subscribe. Easy for me to say. Uh, we appreciate you guys listening. Have a great week. <laughs>